All right, welcome everyone. We're so excited that you're here with us today. We are gonna do one of our fabulous Take Action webinars. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how to support your child at home, helping to make sure that you're able to support your child as they develop, whether that be around social communication or whether that be with language and development and any type of development is going that's going on in your home right where they live. Because we know that often parents are the child's very best therapist. Sometimes kids are enjoying therapy out in the community or or maybe at school, but at home is certainly one of the best places that they can continue to advance and reach their best outcomes. So today we have a crew with us that are amazing. They're from our Echo Autism Early Intervention team, and I would love to have a chance to introduce them. So we're going to start off with Dr. Brett Moore. He is a pediatrician at the University of Missouri. He's also the father of a six-year-old son with autism. He is both as a parent and a physician. He has got a great, unique opportunity to help us understand how children on the, autis on the autism spectrum uh, gain exp expertise and learn um, he has a great opportunity for us to be able to understand that perspective of both a physician and a parent. It's a great chance for us to be able to hear from both of those perspectives. So whether you're listening today as a physician and you want to help think through how do I help parents engage their child at home, or whether you are a parent and you're trying to think about how can I as a parent do more at home. Brett's got a lot of great uh, insight into that, and he will help share with us more as we go forward. He's currently involved in several ECHO autism programs, helping families, implementers, and providers. He's also the medical director of, at the University of Missouri's General Pediatrics Clinic. Brittany Stevenson is an occupational therapist. She's been with the University of Missouri and the Thompson Center for over nine years, and she is a member of the Echo Autism Early Intervention Hub team and has been so since 2019. She also teaches at the University of Missouri in the Graduate Occupational Therapy Program. Michelle Damp is a speech language pathologist with extensive experience evaluating and treating children with a concern for autism spectrum disorder. She participates in interdisciplinary evaluations and provides interventions for patients with autism and various speech and language disorders at the MU Thompson Center for Autism and Neurodevelopmental Disorders. Michelle also offers graduate student instructions, instruction for students at the University of Missouri Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences program. She has been a member of the Echo Autism Early Intervention Hub Team since 2019. Michelle Hainum is the Early Childhood Special Education um, teacher, and she has worked at the Columbia Public Schools Early Childhood Special Education Program for over 15 years, has lots and lots of experience with so many great kids. Uh, she's had different roles, including classroom educator, in iter itinerant teacher, <laughs> behavior specialist, case manager, and trainer for both teachers and parents. She has been part of the Echo Autism Early Intervention Hub team for two years. And then Laura Barnes is a board certified behavior analyst and licensed behavior analyst in Missouri. She serves as the clinical director at the Columbia location for Blue Spriggs Pediatrics, where she provides ABA services for children and adolescents with autism spectrum disorder and other developmental disabilities and their caregivers, teachers, and staff. For over 10 years, she's worked in skill acquisition, skill acquisition and problem behavior uh, reduction in various settings, including center-based clinics, in-home services, group homes, and in school settings. I think everyone listening today is in for a treat as we get a chance to really better understand from these experts how we can help you as parents or maybe you as uh, fellow clinicians and, uh, and experts in the field, how we can support parents right there in their own home. So I'm gonna turn it over to the team to walk us through some great information and then we'll have a great opportunity for questions and answers towards the tail end. So over to you. So today we want to bring a webinar to your home, um, providing some support on how to support your child's development at home. We want to provide some really good specific information to hopefully answer your questions and um, help that development just continue with that home support. So today for our learning objectives, what we want you to come away from this webinar with is the ability to recognize and describe the different areas of child development we want you to be able to identify specific at-home strategies to use with your child to support their development. And then finally, develop a plan for incorporating developmental routines, um, developmental activities into your daily routines. And we provide some pretty specific information to help you achieve all of those objectives. For our areas of child development, Michelle Hainum is going to take over with this one. We're going to touch on a few areas of child development. We're going to talk about adaptive skills. We're going to break each one of these down 
and go into them a little bit further. Um, communication skills and social skills. We're going to break down speech and language. Michelle's going to go into that. We're going to talk about motor. We're going to talk about both fine and gross motor, those big motor skills and little motor skills. We're going to talk about social emotional and all the things that are kind of in with that. Play, such a big part, especially with our early learners. Cognition and academics and kind of how that all kind of plays a role. And then we're going to wrap it up with a little bit of health. And that has a lot to kind of go in it with the sleep and diet. Um, so with our next slide, we're going to go over the adaptive skills and Brittany, our occupational therapist, will go over these for us. So for me, adaptive skills are sort of where the rubber meets the road. You need a lot of these other developmental skills to make a lot of progress in your adaptive behavior. But we're going to go over this first because I think that this is an area that is really important for families. When I think about adaptive behavior, one of the first big skills that comes to mind is those daily self-care skills. So when you think about just being able to get dressed or take a bath or um, cooperate with tooth brushing or maybe even brush your teeth on their own, learn to tie their shoes, those kinds of things are what we would call adaptive skills. It also includes community use. So even in the time of a pandemic, um, maybe just being able to go to the doctor um, or do grocery pickup or whatever that looks like for your family. But there are a lot of skills involved in being a part of the community. So whether that's being in a parking lot safely or even riding in the car safely, um, maybe you've got a child that is able to unhook their harness or um, safety locks are not working for you and you're having some difficulty just even riding in the car or um, tolerating longer car rides. And so um, that's a big area of adaptive behavior that we would like to support you in. Another category would be mealtimes. That can sometimes be one of the most stressful parts of the day for families. And a lot of that is because there are so many skills involved. So that can look like your child's ability to use utensils or be able to open things on their own. What their behavior looks like during mealtimes. Do they sit? Do you all sit at a table? Um, are they able to stick to the stuff that's on their plate? Or is there a lot of um, crying and screaming about what is on their plate or what is not on their plate? Um, are they involved in any of the food preparation? Um, all of those kinds of things. And so we really want to be able to support you in all of these different areas of things that probably happen on a daily basis in your home and could be an area of struggle for you and your family. And so we're going to talk more in detail later, um, but just to kind of give you a little taste of what we're going to talk about, there are a lot of tools out there that can help support adaptive behavior. So that could look like using visual supports. So maybe for a task like toothbrushing, you have a visual in the bathroom posted always that goes through the steps of toothbrushing. Uh, maybe you're using chaining or modeling. And so that looks like breaking down the steps and um, doing a few steps for your child and then having them finish up or having them start the task. So they get the toothbrush wet and you do the rest of it. And then there's all kinds of modeling strategies and we're gonna provide you a lot of different links to find more information about these things, but that could look like you video a sibling doing it, or you video yourself, or you find Blippi on YouTube, or um, another person kind of modeling that behavior that you really want your child to improve in. And there's a lot of evidence behind that kind of strategy. And maybe it's something as simple as changing up the environment. Um, you use a different toothbrush, you get a different car seat, or a different kind of harness. There are all kinds of modified car harnesses out there. Maybe you get a utensil that's a little bit easier to hold um, or you change where they sit at the table. Uh, maybe you can move the table to where their seat's kind of more in the corner and it's a little bit harder to get out or they sit by somebody more preferred um, or they have access to something more preferred or you use a timer. So there are a lot of um, kind of tricks and tips out there that can help support adaptive behavior. All right, thanks, Brittany. The next area that we're going to talk about is the area of communication. Um, so this area is a huge area to talk about. There's a lot um, related to this um, field. First thing we're going to do is talk about the difference between speech and language. Um, so when you're looking at your child and evaluating their speech or wondering if their speech is on track, what you're referring to with the speech is that motor movement. So the articulation of how they say their sounds, are they putting in like a W for R sound like wabbit for rabbit or like a frontal lisp like snake for snake. So you're listening more to those sounds. 
Um, another area of the speech would be the voice. So thinking about the pitch, the volume, the quality. Sometimes with allergies, we get like hoarse voices, which right now I kind of have a little bit of a hoarse voice. Um, we also think about fluency. So are they stuttering, having some disfluencies in their speech? Um, so those are all that the areas when we're thinking about speech or when a speech language pathologist talks about speech. The other area that we um, assess and look at and deal with, and also for you to look at the development is the area of language. So with language, we can have verbal language, we can have sign language, we can have a child using a speech generating device, that's all language. Um, so we typically break language down into receptive language and expressive language. So with receptive language, is your child understanding directions at the age that they should be understanding them? So for a one-year-old, um, you know, you can, you know, say point to the ball and they can point to the ball. That's receptive language. Um, for expressive language, you hold up the ball and that one-year-old says ball, that's expressive language. So that just kind of gives you an idea of the difference between the two. Um, and then we'll provide some ways a little bit later for you to really um, build your child's language and make it stronger or what to do if you feel like there might be a weakness in that area. So the next slides go through exact development by age. It's surprising to some people that we can start as early as six months of age looking to make sure that a child is on track with their speech and language development. So if you have a six month old and you're talking to your six month old and babbling and doing all that good stuff and your six month old is giving you some decent eye contact, um, smiling, Im imitating some of those sounds, simple sounds just like ah, 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 or e or ba, 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 or doing the mama, da, da, you might start seeing some of those things about that age. Um, we also want to see the child start to respond to his or her own name when you call it. And then also, you know, you can tell a lot, not just by the words that are being said, but that nonverbal. So with the sounds that your child is making, is he or she showing um, some joy or is he showing some displeasure, um, maybe when presented with a food that he doesn't like. So, um, and again, just starting to say some of those consonant sounds. Some communication milestones around the one year age, responding to those simple spoken requests um, pick up your spoon, and they're able to pick up their spoon. Also using those gestures, that's a form of nonverbal communication or body language. Um, so those gestures, like shaking their head, no, I don't want any more peas, or waving bye-bye when grandma leaves. Um, also making some sounds that changes in tone, so it might go up at the end to kind of signify a question. We want to see those one-year-olds start to use one word expressively, so they might be saying mama, dada, or might be saying uh-oh. Um, and then also we want to see that child try to imitate some words that you are trying to say. So they're not gonna say them clearly, it's not gonna be perfect and exact, but the, just that they're watching your face and trying to do some of the same things that you're doing. And then by age two, we definitely want them to be able to point to some things or pictures whenever they're named. Um, knowing the names of familiar people when you say like, where's mom? They're looking in the direction of mom or dad. Um, saying sentences with two to four words. So you can kind of think about the expressive language like the utterance length at age one year, you want your child using one word moving into two words together. So drink, ball, milk. When they get into age two, we want them to start using two words together. So you know, more milk or my milk. Um, and then by age three, we definitely want them putting three words together, some four word sentences. Um, with that three-year-old, we want them to be able to follow directions that are a little more complex. Um, so, you know, like go get your shoes and then we're gonna brush your teeth. So they go get their shoes and then they go brush their teeth or we're gonna brush your teeth and then go get your PJs on. So they're starting to understand that receptive language, some of those directions. Um, they can also name some really familiar things, especially the nouns. So if you say, what is this? They can say ball um, or red ball. Um, understanding words like in, on, and under. So, you know, put your spoon on the sink. They can understand that. 
Um, do you have any friends? And maybe they can name one of their friends that they, they have to play with. Um, we want to see them start using some of the pronouns. So like I, me, you, um, also for their speech to be well enough for strangers to understand. It may not be super perfect, but it's, it's good enough for someone else to understand. Um, you know, me drink milk. So you understand that the child saying, you know, I drink milk. And then also just being able to carry on just a short little conversation. And you can see that in this picture here, you know, such cute things going on, such good language going on, good eye contact with mom, definitely some shared enjoyment there. Um, looks like she's even imitating like mom's exact posture. Um, so really cute stuff there to show you kind of what that age three language looks like. The next or the, uh, the area that I started talking about was that speech articulation area. This is an area where parents I find get the most concerned. So my child's talking, but I can't understand them um, or grandma can't understand them. We get that a lot. This is a really nice chart that shows you exactly at what age the child should be able to say their sounds. So when you look at this chart, like for the sound P or P, you can see that by age three, 90% of the children are able to say that sound. Um, this is a great reference. Um, we give it out to parents to kind of help them see exactly which sounds. So if your child is three years old and they're still saying rabbit for rabbit, that's okay. It's not developmentally appropriate for them to have that R sound. It would be fabulous if they did, um, but I would give them a little more time before I would be pushing for speech and language therapy. The one thing I would say to, to caution you with this chart, if your child has numerous sounds and error, even if those sounds are above their developmental age, so let's say that um, our three-year-old, our three-year-old is not able to do S's, L's, R's, CH's, SH's, they're really having a lot of trouble with speech, highly unintelligible. I would definitely encourage you to get your child evaluated if that's the case, even though those sounds might be beyond the developmentally appropriate age, um, because that can be another concern. So, um, you know, definitely keep that in mind. It never hurts to have that evaluation if you have some concerns, just to make sure, you know, that your child is on track, um, or if not, to be able to provide you some recommendations, or if your child needs that speech and language therapy to give them that boost. Um, that's all good things to keep in mind. So now Brittany's gonna go back over some of the motor skills, the gross and fine motor. So in thinking about these milestones, just a reminder that these are benchmarks and what we're expecting around that age and every child's different and develop these skills at a different pace. And sometimes kids will have an explosion in those fine motor skills and not as much in their gross or vice versa. And for some of us, some of these skills are strengths or not. Um, gross motor skills were never my strength, but fine motor has always been pretty good for me. And so just remember that these don't always track exactly like this, but I wanted to talk about them separated so that you um, were kind of reminded that they are different. So around age one, we're really looking for a child to be walking and um, being able to start doing steps when holding somebody's hand and waving bye-bye and some of those simple motor imitations. And then fine motor, wise around that same age that they can turn pages of a book pretty well. Um, those large insert puzzles that have like the knobs that they could do those. They're using a spoon to eat. Uh, I'm not saying they're not spilling, but they understand the concept and are able to do it on their own, um, even with spilling. Um, they're using what we call a pincer grasp. So that's that, you know, your index and thumb together to be able to pick up Cheerios or small objects. And even at this age that they could stack three to five, like one inch blocks together on a level surface. And then around age two, um, that's where things start getting really exciting. We wanna see them running and jumping with both feet, even being able to climb stairs without support, uh, kicking a ball and starting to ride a tricycle, um, being able to kind of try to throw a ball back and forth. Again, we're not looking for a uh, professional baseball player here, but understanding that concept um, and maybe catching the ball against their body. And then fine motor wise at that same age, at age two, we, we wanna see them scribbling so they know what a writing utensil is. And that could be any kind, it could be chalk or crayon, but they can scribble on paper. They could stack even more of those blocks. 
And then with fasteners and clothing, they're starting to undo so they can unzip their jacket. Uh, maybe a large button on like a teddy bear, or if they do have clothing that has it, there are not many kids clothes that have big buttons, but that they could undo it. If you have a little open cup, think about like Dixie cups or really small cups because at age two, their hands are still really little that they could drink from it. And again, I'm not saying they don't spill it, but um, there's kind of minimal spillage when they're just going to take a drink. By age three, they can do a little bit more of sophisticated things. They could catch a ball um, pretty reliably, balance on a foot, and fine motor wise, looking a lot better with utensils spilling a lot less. Um, instead of just scribbling, now we expect that they could copy lines and circles, um, that they could start snipping with scissors. And parents feel like that's a very terrifying age to get scissors, but I promise you will make any two or three-year-old very happy if you let them hold scissors. Um, and they make safety scissors where they're not, they're blunt on the end, they're safe, or you could start with those Play-Doh scissors that cannot hurt anyone, um, I guess, unless you just really tried. And at, by age three, we're looking for a tripod grasp on a writing utensil. So that's where you're using kind of your three fingers together. What's more important is that their thumb and index finger are kind of opposed. If they've got more than three fingers on a writing utensil, that's okay. And getting even better at buttons. By four, they're really good at running and jumping and climbing, just super active. You think about those kids in the playground, just bouncing off the walls and um, doing more sophisticated things like skipping um, or somersaults or hopping on foot and being kind of proud of that. And then fine motor wise, they could copy more simple shapes like a square or a triangle or a cross and being able to cut out large shapes. By five, that's when we're looking at riding a bicycle with training wheels, getting that swing to go back and forth on their own, jumping rope, you know, it just gets more and more complicated. And then fine motor wise, they could probably write their own name, um, open a food package like a screw top water bottle or a Ziploc bag, being able to scrub with a knife, puzzles. And then by age six, you can do more advanced things, sports, swimming, skating, um, scooters, that kind of thing. And then fine motor wise, tie shoes, you know, write letters of the alphabet. So you can see how sophisticated and we kind of expect these motor skills to be by six. Thank you, Brittany. So next we're going to turn over the rest of our child development information to our early educator, Michelle Hainham. Okay, so um, like Michelle and Brittany have already said, children, all children develop differently um, and all areas of development de develop at different rates as well. So where we're talking that sometimes kids really take off and they are really running all over the place, but they might not be big talkers. Other kids may be really big talkers, but not really into motor skills. Um, all of those areas of development all develop at different things and different paces for every kiddo. So right now we're gonna talk about social emotional. And this is kind of one that's kind of the forgotten area, I think at times, um, but social emotional is huge. And a lot of these skills need to be taught just like all those other skill areas need to be taught as well. Um, and celebrated when they do those things as well so the kid knows that they're doing those right things. So there's kind of a lot in this area. Um, we really talk about that area of social emotional, you know, learning your emotions. Well, kids aren't born with just the innate sense of knowing what all the emotions are. And there is definitely a wide range of emotions that all of us feel on a daily basis, including myself. Um, even us as adults have a wide range of emotions that we feel on a daily basis. And there are days I want to cry and days I want to be really happy and days that I am just really grumpy. Um, kids have the same thing and they just don't know what those emotions are in the beginning. So in the beginning, we really need to take this opportunity to teach them when they're sad and tell them that like when they're crying, you can tell them you're sad. Um, showing them a picture of it, showing on your face that you're sad with them. I'm so sorry you're sad. Um, but we really have to work on, you know, helping them learn um, those emotions are okay. Um, it's just what we do with our body when we have those emotions and kind of how to work through some of those things. We oftentimes talk about self-control. Um, oftentimes kids have problems with self-control and are really impulsive. Um, one of, you know, be the first one to grab that or always running across the house or those kind of pieces. And so really having to learn on how to help them slow their bodies, how to help them take that couple extra seconds, take a deep breath, um, slowing things down, that they're still going to get that um, full cup of milk um, but you don't want them running across the house with it. They need to sit down and they need to wait for me to bring it to them or they can ask for those, knowing that they're still gonna kind of get those pieces. Um, and then interactions and developing relationships with others is so huge. Um, really needing to take the time 
to connect with another person. And that starts from day one, in utero even, that you're making those connections and building that relationship. They learn voices instantly. And so really having to build upon those kind of pieces, um, you know, they can start to tell the difference in the tone of our voice. And so even if we're not saying that we're sad, but we have that sad intonation in our voice, the kids are going to kind of pick up on those emotions, even if we're not outwardly displaying them to others. And so we really need to be mindful of, you know, our actions as well as the kids are looking to us because we are um, adults and teachers. You parents are their number one teacher always. And so we always around them have to make sure that we are doing our best job too. And I know as a parent myself, there are days that it's really hard to put on that happy face and keep on going. Um, and some days you don't have to. Some days you just have to say, mommy is sad. You know, I'm going to go take a deep breath and then I'll be ready to go. Um, so at home, we really need to think about um, making sure that we kind of have those established rules or expectations in our house um, that we talk about, you know, we can use our safe walking feet in the house, we can go outside and we can run, you know, running is always something that kids want to do every place they go. And so a big thing is, is, you know, when you're saying stop running, stop running, they hear stop or running. Um, so it's better to say use your safe walking feet. So even if they hear safe or walking, at least you're getting something a little bit better than just run. So really trying to help those kids really establish kind of what your expectations are in the house. And along with that is really talking through those emotions. Start simple. Don't start with the frustrated and all those angry things. Just start with the happy, sad, or even happy, mad kind of thing. Um, the younger you start those conversations, the easier that language is going to be able to um, change and get more sophisticated as they get older. Um, as they are reading books, as they are doing harder skills, you can talk about those things. Role modeling, we kind of already talked about role modeling and video modeling. Those are great ways to be able to show kids emotions and be able to work on those. There's so many great things out in the world. There's so many good um, children's shows that really do a great job of illustrating um, emotions and what to do and puts it on their level. Um, and that's a big thing too, is making sure that we're providing them specific strategies that they can do that they can be successful in their level. And then the last thing I'm gonna share on this one is to make making sure that we're giving that really good feedback when they are doing what we need them to do and we expect them to do. So just like academics, like when a kid is identifying their colors, when a kid is using their safe walking feet across the house, you're going to celebrate that. Thank you for using your safe walking feet. You know, do the high fives and the excitement there too, because they need to know that what they're doing is what you expect of them and what they need to do. Okay. Um, the next area is one of my favorite areas to move to. And we're going to talk about play um, and play for these guys that, um, I don't know, this is why I'm a preschool teacher because I love play. Um, we all do. Um, and Play is just so much the learning platform for kiddos that are young. And off to the side on this one, it has some age ranges, but again, just like we were talking about all the areas, they develop differently for everybody. So these are just kind of guidelines um, where we're looking at just the changes in play. So when play kind of starts out at birth, just making contact and um, them just kind of looking around and in their environment, that's where play starts just taking in, looking around the room, figuring out where they are in life, those kind of pieces. And then they begin to play with toys. As Brittany was saying, you know, those fine motor and gross motor skills start to develop even at a very young age, but they're able to pick up toys and they're able to play with them. Um, as Michelle was saying, they start to develop some of those language pieces and start making little sounds and noises and giggle. That's all kind of that beginning play piece. Um, being there with them and supporting that piece, making sure they have appropriate toys making sure that they have all of those things at their, their beck and call and at their fingertips. Um, it is sometimes good that you put them out of their fingertips reach that so they have to move to it to use some of those motor skills um, that you're repeating back to them, those language pieces. But all of that, so we're taking all these other areas of development and we're wrapping them all together. We need all of them to kind of work on that piece. As kiddos develop a little bit more, you start getting that parallel play as they grow. So they start taking some of the same toys and they play next to another kid. They're not necessarily the age, they're really ready to share toys because that's really hard to give up ownership of a toy and not hoard everything. But they start to play alongside and they start to develop a few of those things. And as they get a little older, they start to get more interested in their friends and they want to play alongside. They want to share those toys and they want to start 
developing different kind of play schemes. Um, they'll climb and run around the playground together. They get interested in just how another kid is doing something and they want to do that and they're drawn to that. Um, that's why it's so nice to have kids together. So if we have opportunities to have play groups, to have them in preschools, you know, that they can really um, have those experiences with others. And play is one of those things that sometimes you need that level of language skills to kind of go along with it. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes running around a playground, you don't have to have language to do that. You run around, you play, you smile, you climb up a climber, you go down the slide and you chase everyone around again. Um, so knowing kind of where your kid is at, um, kind of where that level is, you know how to kind of help them facilitate and kind of where to put that out. And then that last level is really um, the fun part is where they're really cooperative, they're really are going back and forth and sharing those tools and toys and dress up. But along that comes that conflict resolution and problem solving and I really don't want to share all these toys. Um, and that's when it's good to make sure that we're kind of near and close to them, that we can help them facilitate that play, be there to help them kind of do those problem solving skills giving them the reminders that um, if you're a little sad, what you can do, because that oftentimes those social skills and those emotions can kind of run high. Um, and having different kinds of games um, is a great way and a great tool of kind of some of that play. And that's easy kind of facilitation of, you know, it has rules, um, the kids have, kind of have to learn turn taking, but making sure that we're making sure that we're putting it on their level and we're not taking a game that takes too long that they lose interest before they get to the end of that game. Um, taking turns, anything that you can kind of go back and forth with, even on skills like Brittany was talking about using Play-Doh and scissors, you can practice taking turns with the Play-Doh scissors and using that and you can develop in that language piece along with it. Um, and along with all of that, um, we're gonna roll right into cognition and academics because it really does lend itself to go right into that um, and this is another big area. We have so many things that are involved when you think about a kiddo and how much cognition and how much a kid learns from birth to even a couple years old, that they're learning how to move their body and walk and talk and just process everything that's going on around them and what to do with it. So we really have to think about how is a kid learning new skills? And like all of us, we all learn things a little bit differently. There's people that are more auditory learners where they can just hear something and then all of a sudden it just clicks. Um, there's some people that can just see it one time and they've got it. There's some really hands-on learners where they need to have it on their hands and they need to kind of manipulate it and be able to do it. And um, we all learn a little bit differently. So figuring out kind of how your child learns best um, will help you to know kind of how to kind of go down that path of supporting them through that learning and kind of where they need to kind of be. Um, problem solving and thinking really comes into this this plan of as they're developing their cognition and they're learning new skills, you have to start thinking about how do I get from point A to point B? How do I problem solve? How do I get that toy that mom just took away from me and put up on the counter? Well, I'm gonna move this step stool over and I'm gonna climb up on that. Nope, she took the step stool away. Well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go to my bedroom and I'm gonna get out the blocks. I'm gonna bring them into the kitchen and I'm gonna stack them up next to the kitchen counter and I'm gonna climb up there. That's kind of what we're looking at. You're thinking that kiddo is problem solving and really thinking through how they're going to get to that. But they had to be able to think about all those things in their environment to be able to put them together with that. And that's where that memory piece, you might have taken that toy and you might have put it on top of the refrigerator, but they're going to remember that that's where you put it. And that's where you always put those toys that get taken away. Um, and so they might be throwing a fit in the kitchen, beating on the fridge, and you think they want to eat when really it's because of the toys at the top of the fridge and they remember. Um, so we really have to kind of sometimes remember what we've done as parents. Um, if we put those toys on the counter and you know that they're going to go get that step stool from the other room, um, you have to be thinking ahead of them sometimes. And that can kind of get kind of difficult the older they get. Um, and sometimes as they get more sophisticated with their motor skills and their language skills, all of that stuff, all of that comes together. Um, also, sometimes it doesn't come together and they have some more higher emotions and they just get frustrated and throw themselves down on the floor. Um, so we want to be there to support that kind of piece too. But big things for cognition and academics, just like you want to teach them how to say their colors. So you're, you practice over and over again, this is blue, this is red, this is yellow. You do the same thing with just reading to your kid, sitting down, having those conversations, pointing out different things, letting them learn how to turn the pages of the book, having them go and pick out a different book, um, but utilizing what you already have at home, not that you have to go out and buy anything, 
you know, using everyday tasks that you already have in the house of setting the table. Well, how many people are home today? Counting everybody that's in the house. What do we need to eat with today? Okay, well, we're, we're having pizza. What do we need? Do we need bowls or plates? Really giving them those pieces and those opportunities to answer the questions that you can ask. Can they figure out those pieces? Can they do that thinking on their own? Can they do that counting? Or can they remember from day one, okay, yesterday everybody was home and there's five in our family, so I need five plates. Can they remember that, ne that the next day? Um, and the last time we had pizza, well, we didn't need silverware because we're just gonna eat with our fingers. We don't need forks and spoons. We just need plates, those kind of pieces and getting them involved in kind of that cooking process is a great way to help them with learning those kind of things and kind of wrapping that all up. So my last area I'm gonna talk about is kind of health. And this is kind of where we kind of like kind of bring it all kind of together. Um, and health kind of is a lot of things um, because if we're not healthy, then we're going to really struggle on using our language skills and being able to feel good enough to get up and run around and drive our parents crazy. So we really do need to make sure that we are doing a good job um, as parents and caregivers that we are supporting the best way that we can. We want to make sure that we uh, are providing a safe environment for them to be in, for them to do all of those things, to run, to jump, Maybe that's outside or you have a space in your house where they can run and jump and be on a trampoline and do all those big movements. Um, you want to make sure that you have that safe environment where they can feel that they can do all of that play and use that language and use those motor skills and develop all of those. We also want to make sure that we're being consistent in our daily routines that the kiddo is able to know kind of what's coming next so they can be relying on not having to worry about where they're going to sleep at night and when that next meal is going to come and just being consistent in our daily routine. We really want to make sure that our kids are getting ample amount of sleep. Sleep can be a big thing because if you're always going into that day being super tired and not having gotten enough sleep, it's going to be really hard for you to be able to take in information, process it, and then give something back to somebody else. Um, eating is another big thing, and that's another big thing we talk about um, if you have picky eaters, not so picky eaters, eating too much, not eating enough, um, providing those choices at mealtime, having them get involved to kind of help with that kind of piece. Um, and the big thing is, is making sure that you're staying up with having your re regular medical checkups with your pediatrician. You know, if there's ever a concern that you have in any area, don't feel bad of asking the question. If you're worried about something, it'd be better to ask the question than just to sit and not ask the question and wait on it too long. So if you ask somebody a question, they're gonna give you an answer. Um, and then you'll be able to feel better either A, you need to go get some extra help or B, know that you're still in that wide range of whatever we consider developmentally appropriate as kiddos are developing. Um, because there is a wide range in all of those skill sets um, as we're going through all of those pieces. Thanks, Michelle. That was a lot of great information. So for our learning objectives, we've gone through the first one and added a little bit of information from the second one. For our third one, we want to help you develop a plan for implementation. So implementation of um, skills, implementation of tasks that will help you overall with your child's development and whatever area your child may need a little more, um, a little more attention to. So the number one um, suggestion that we have for developing that plan is to use the tools from the CDC's webpage or app. They have a fabulous, um, you can get the information either on the webpage or the app. It's called Learn the Signs Early. It will take you through exactly what your, what your child should be doing at different ages, and then also give you some suggestions for how to help them at home. Um, one way to do it to where it's very individualized for your child is to really sit and think, um, what are the strengths of my child? So what, do, what does he or she do well? Um, has he been walking since you know 10 months and pulling up on things and just really has that strong body strength, but maybe isn't saying a whole lot of words. So it's important to think about the strengths in addition to the areas of growth. And then you can really develop a plan, you can play on those strengths. So if language is maybe a weaker area and the motor skills are a stronger area, take your child outside, let them play on the playground, but withhold those swings until your child says, you know, swing, or I want to swing, or shows some communication um, effort at that point. So that's just one idea. And then the fourth thing is just to develop a plan using the information and resources 
that we're providing within this webinar. There are so many out there. So the ones that we have recommended um, for the resources are um, great resources, evidence-based information um, that we have all used, we've shared with parents. So I hope you find that helpful. For our next few slides, what we're going to do is go over very specific home strategies. I know as a parent myself, um, if you said, oh, you need to play with your child more, I'm like, okay, well, what exactly does that look like? How can I incorporate all of these different areas um, into something that we already have in our schedule? So the first um, uh, task that we're going to talk about is just mealtime and snacks. We have to eat, we have to prepare our meals. So how can we work on some of these areas of child development within our mealtimes and snacks? So Brittany, our occupational therapist, is going to take you through um, the adaptive and motor and the social, emotional, and play, and then I'll hit on that communication, cognition, and health area. Yeah, so this is where we would really implore you as a parent to be your most creative self because we do not have all of the solutions. So I would just like you to think creatively along with us about which of these strategies sound like something that might work for your family. So when we think about um, just that adaptive behavior, being able to eat together, there are so many different kinds of utensils and plates. So when I think about a one-year-old in my home who was super grumpy at meals and I as his mother realized that probably what was making him the most upset was the fact that he did not have access to a plate because he had a really nice habit of chucking a plate every time it was on his tray. And so I found off Amazon these little dinosaur plates that have a suction cup at the bottom. So now his plate and the two-year-old's plate match and I can suction it to his tray and it makes him immensely happier than when he doesn't have it. And it makes mealtimes a lot more pleasant for everyone and I can focus on other aspects of that mealtime, like having a variety of foods and other things and using utensils, because now I don't have to worry about him being upset that his plate is not right with him. So just think about all those things that are out there. Um, try to incorporate, if there's a highly preferred food that your kiddo loves, always put it in a Ziploc sack and seal it for them. And then they are highly motivated to be able to undo it on their own um, or really get them in the kitchen with you, get them a step stool so they can help wash, you know, maybe these foods that are less preferred like blueberries or strawberries. And um, they've got a little colander in the sink and kids love to participate in those kinds of things. And then they're, you know, having an interaction with food in a positive way. So the more that you can encourage those things that you want out of mealtimes in your home. Maybe it's not sitting together or maybe it is, or maybe it's sitting for a certain amount of time or um, just being able to kind of interact together at the table. Have those really clear expectations. Don't set them too high and just try to stick to them. So one of the expectations I have, I can't handle food being thrown on the floor because we have a dog that insists on sitting underneath our table and I want my dog to live. And so that's just one of the expectations I have. So even the one-year-old, like if you chuck the food, it just goes right back on your tray. Um, and it's not that I'm forcing my kid to eat the food, but the food stays on your tray, whether or not you're going to eat it. And I just stick to that expectation. And now he knows that that's part of it. Um, some people that's, that's not a salient to you of what matters. So just know what matters for you and your family. Um, you can cook together, take turns whose job it is today. And kids really love that to have that sense of ownership about what's happening. And then as far as the communication and cognition and health piece, um, naming those foods that you're eating, talking about the plate, bowl, napkin, comment as you're cooking. So I'm pouring the juice, or if it's a one-year-old, cut your utterance down shorter. So just pour the juice or pour juice, um, repeating your child's utterance. So, and expand on that. So if your child says milk, um, then you can say, yeah, you know, pour milk or drink milk so that they're getting that um, language expansion and model. Also offering choices. I think this is a huge way I have learned to deal with behaviors and also with communication. So do you want milk or juice? Um, and then wait for that response, model whatever needs to be modeled. Make those silly mistakes during your meal times. That will really cause some communication um, initiation from your child. So give your child that bowl oh, here's your cereal, but forget to put the cereal in. And the child will be like, what? Wait a minute, what are you doing? So then they'll be like, you know, have to ask for that cereal. Um, or whenever you give them that juice, just give them a tiny amount of that juice. So then they have to ask for more juice. Um, also have those discussions about healthy food. You can use visual supports such as my plate, um, which is a very nice, easy 
um, visual to use so they can see you know, where the, the vegetables, the fruits, the meats, everything needs to go. So our next home strategy uh, deals with washing hands. That's something that we definitely have to deal with on a daily basis with our children. Um, and again, Brittany will uh, start out talking about that adaptive motor and social emotional and play part of it. Yeah, so again, keep in mind that every kiddo is different. And if there's a hang up here for your child um, on just the actual act of washing hands, I just want you to kind of think through some of those things that could be helpful to you. We want it to be an experience where, as you see listed on here, there's lots of learning opportunities as part of washing hands, but also washing hands is just one of those behaviors we really want kids to master well and do well for many, many, many health reasons. But um, some of the best strategies are just to use hand over hand and then slowly take away that support. So you are helping your child walk through those steps of what it feels like to turn things on. Um, sometimes it's really hard for kids even to reach, and then that's part of what's unmotivating. Um, you can buy, they're called like faucet extenders, where they're just like a little piece of plastic, and it hooks onto the end of the faucet so that the water comes out closer to the edge of the sink, because for a lot of kids, they can't reach all the way to the back. Or you can, I mean, you can tape or um, pipe cleaner, all kinds of stuff to the knobs, depending on what your, you know, sinks um, where you live look like, so that your kiddo can reach those. But to the best of your ability, try to help them through those steps and have soap easy to reach, soap that maybe foams already for them, something that doesn't take a lot of effort on their part. And then as they start mastering that, you know, really praising them for the parts that they're doing on their own. You could use a visual. So you could start at the top and have a picture of what it looks like to turn on the water and get your hands wet and then get the soap and take them through each picture. And so then you have that as a reference when you're washing hands with your child and you can point to that picture or show it to them. And then they can start using the pictures as a prompt on their own without you having to say anything. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of modify that task to make it look a little bit better. And then also with the visual supports that really helps to facilitate that receptive language. So the child's able to see it you're talking about it. So they're really understanding all the pieces and parts. Um, again, same kind of things as with the cooking activity, you're going to name soap, faucet, water, everything. And then also commenting about what you're doing as you're doing it. So the child can hear those words, um, repeating what your child says and expanding on that. And then doing that expectant wait. I think that's something that can really, it really does help to facilitate communication with kids. And then they also kind of think, does she really know what she's doing? Um, and it, it just kind of gives them that, that sense of wanting to communicate with you. So if you're saying, hey, let's go wash our hands. And then you just sit there, you're like, wait a minute, we need water. Oh yeah, we need water. And then you turn that water on, you know, just kind of, kind of let that child lead um, and teach you or talk you through what needs to be done. Those pauses in your conversation are powerful in getting your child to communicate. Um, and then also with the health part, definitely teaching and talking about how important clean hands are to be healthy, importance of you know, the times that we need to wash our hands. But in addition to that, with everything that we have going on now, you know, talking about the masks and why we need to wear the masks and the social distancing. So you'll add all of that in there too. For our next two slides, we're gonna talk about songs and rhymes and reading. Um, and we're gonna let Michelle Hainum take over for these as our early educator. Okay, so songs and rhymes. We're gonna talk about, um, again, all of this is kind of building upon everything else. So you're gonna be able to find what works for you and what songs um, you want to get stuck in your head for every day, all week long, that you always go back through all day long. Um, so again, um, finding those ones that are fun for you and our interest level, that's that buy-in process. So at the specific age, it may be a baby shark song, um, and then later in life, it may be something different. So kind of having to figure out kind of the interest level of where your kiddos are at. But in the beginning, you're just looking at them to copy and imitate some of those movements. So you know, the wheels on a bus go round and round and you're doing that together. Um, as they get older, they're able to put more of those together. So, you know, where it might be that they're just kind of getting their hands up, you know, then they are really developing into being able to actually turn the wheels all the way around, as well as doing wipers and doing the whole song with you. In the beginning, it may be that they 
are listening and smiling and are, you know, interacting that way with you, but they may not be doing many of the actions, but the older they get, the more complex their actions will be able to go. You know, the nice way um, to tie into a lot of learning for kids is by songs. You can teach a lot of things through songs, the days of the week, the months of the year, and emotions. I'm happy and sad. You know, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands and you have that big smile. You know, when you don't, you're sad. You know, everybody has a sad and you're stompy, that kind of piece. So being able to take different things that you need to teach them and put it to song. There are lots of kiddos that learn through music. There's lots of people that love to have music on in the background all the time because it's just kind of soothing. Kiddos are the same way. You just grow up and that's what we still like as an adult. Um, for, you know, communication, cognition, health, play, all we've been saying, you know, talk to your kids, read to your kids, interact with your kids, have those conversations. So you're really wanting those word plays with them. Um, start a song and stop and have them fill in the blank. The same way with a book or a rhyme when you're reading it to them. Um, after they've heard it a couple of times, start saying and then have them repeat it back to you or have them start it and you finish it. Um, they really like to be able to have that opportunity to be part of it and have uh, the time to be the teacher as well. Um, you know, taking different items around your house um, and turning it into um, pretend items where I can turn, I got an ink pen, but I pretend it's a, a, a telephone, to talk on the telephone, taking just different opportunities to have fun, be silly. Um, this is your opportunity, you know, to let your hair down and put it however you want and wear the silly hats and make the silly faces. Um, you really want to encourage them to ask for more. And as a young Infant and toddler, it may be that they're just kind of like right up in your face and they're smiling about it and you're just going to teach them the sign more and, you know, they're finally starting to give you a letter sound in their mouth. Mm -hmm. And finally, you know, oh, they're wanting more. You say, oh, you want more song. And then yes. And then it does get to be more elaborate where they're able to communicate with you that I am all done with baby shark. Maybe it's time for a new song. Um, those kind of pieces. Um, and you know, as those kids are young and you want them to be involved and they don't have a lot of motor skills and you're singing the wheels on the bus, you can have a bus. Or if you're singing, oh, McDonald, get out the farm animals. They can pick which farm animal you want to sing next if their communication is low. And they picked it up and it's the pig. Oh, you want to sing about the pig. It's a really good way to help them kind of be involved. Um, and no matter their level of motor or language, um, you can always find a way to make those kind of pieces kind of fun. That lends us to the next one, which is reading. And reading is so important um, on so many different levels. And again, I always want to preface with whatever books and interests you have at your house, that's where you're going to go to. Um, my kids definitely liked two totally different things, um, but I have a lot of books about princess and fairies and a lot of dinosaur and truck books. So, um, but doesn't mean that you can't, um, as you know, I have a boy and I had a girl, um, but take times that uh, we also share books too. Um, but let them go and pick out their own books. And, you know, in the beginning, uh, since my daughter was born first, I had a lot of girl books and not a lot of boy books. So when my boy came along, I had them all and they were all on the shelves together. Um, and you'd be surprised, let them make their own choice and go over and pick out a book. Um, they like that piece of having that ownership and learning um, how to go and get a book off the shelf and which one they want. And then they realize that's not the book they wanted and they put it back. And there's motor skills and thinking and problem solving and all of that kind of stuff that's involved with just going and picking out a book before they even come to bring it to you. Um, learning on working how to hold a book, how it's held correctly, how to be gentle with a book, how to turn the pages. Um, and sometimes it is hard that you want to just flip really fast and they don't want to read anything. And we can go back to some of those other developmental areas, that self-control and kind of learning on how to take our time. Um, we're going to at least read a Hey, we're going to read a couple words. We're going to point to a couple pictures uh, before we turn to the next page. Uh, again, the books that have the little lift and flat pieces where they can kind of get annoying and kind of get destroyed. Um, they are wonderful little tools of getting kids interested in books because it puts their interest level and it gives them something interactive to do. It keeps their interest there for a little bit longer than if you just had a plain book that just had a couple pictures on it. Uh, again, if you want to teach something, you want to teach emotions, you want to teach colors, you want to teach letters, Get a book that has those things in it. Um, and then those can be those books that you refer to back um, as they know them really well. And if they are struggling with colors, you can say, oh, remember we had that color book. Remember the apple is, and they're like, oh yeah, red. You kind of give that association of they can be able to put those things together. 
Um, oh, remember when the turtle was crying? He was really sad. All oh, right. Um, and then you can give them something to kind of refer back to. Again, reading like a lot of areas in, um, in the world, in our house, and as we're, you want to have those rules and expectations. You know, we want to make sure we practice good book handling skills that we're not ripping the pages. And so we talk about how we have to be gentle with them. Just like at mealtimes, how we talk about if the food needs to stay, food needs to stay on the table. Um, we're not throwing our cup across the room. Um, when we're all done with something, we can just use our words and say, I'm all done. Um, and like at bath time, the water stays in the bathtub. We're not gonna splash it all over the place. So really kind of talking about those pieces of our expectations. So really with communication, when you're reading, it is so many opportunities. They can point at pictures and say a word. They can follow directions and we tell them to point at a picture. Um, or we start thinking about having them as they get older, you can say, ooh, look, you know, if the dog is running and it looks like he's getting ready to fall in a puddle, you ask the question, what do you think is going to happen on the next page as those kids are developing their listening and their processing skills? We're really working on them trying to expand those words. So again, just like we were doing with the songs, if it's a book that you're reading on a regular basis and you don't really want to read the little blue truck one more time, um, have them start filling in those blanks for you. So then it becomes them reading the book um, and you're just facilitating that reading kind of piece. Um, that's when it becomes really fun. When you kind of slow and you're taking your time and they start putting in all those words for you because you're going too slow, you know you've done a really good job of reading and teaching. Um, and then they're learning that that word on paper is meaningful and does mean something. Um, you know, you can use those books um, as a tools for all kinds of learning and expansion of knowledge um, and interest levels of growing. So have fun, read every day. Awesome, thank you, Michelle. So our last slide is just going through some different resources, different references. Um, you can find some good information as far as communication skills and milestones on the American Speech Language Hearing Association website. Like we mentioned before, the CDC has a great website for developmental milestones. Um, they also have good information if you have any concerns about developmental delays or autism. Um, they have some questionnaires on there to help guide you. Um, autism Navigator is also another good website, a good resource if you have any concerns about your child. Um, if you think that your child may possibly have autism, they have some really good parent information and parent trainings. Um, the um, SLP Scrapbook has early language ideas at home. Goodreads has book lists for various ages. Um, I put a link on here from Sanders that has the When Speech Sounds Are Learned chart. Um, another resource that is kind of fun I give to parents is the Dolly Parton Imagination Station. She has a website where you can sign up your child and you will get a free book every so often. Um, Pinterest, of course, is one of my favorites, and you can find some fun resources on there if you know what specific area you're trying to build up in your child. YouTube has some good videos. Just make sure you watch them first before you share them with your child. Sometimes YouTube surprises us with some things. Um, and then also your local library. Take your child there. Allow them to explore the library. Allow them to, you know, start to figure out their own interests. Even when they're one and two years old, there are Definitely some activities, some toys, some puzzles, some age appropriate books. So um, I highly encourage the library and um, Autism Speaks is another great website if you have any concerns for your child with possible autism concerns. Um, so I think those are give you some pretty good um, references and resources. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up our um, PowerPoint presentation and we will follow this up with some question, a question answer session for everyone. Great, thank you guys so much. That was wonderful. And you know, as I'm sitting here thinking about what a great opportunity people had to listen to the different types of development that children have, it's always reminding me just what a joy we have as both parents and clinicians to get to be part of watching kids learn and grow and develop, right? I mean, so many fun, fun opportunities. So. Um, let's go ahead and dive into some questions and I want to start off kind of re um, setting our uh, sights back in the space. We've got a chance to learn all about this development. So let's think about what 
can we do as parents um, in the context at home? And so Brett, I'm gonna come to you first. So what are some of your favorite things to do? I know you're a pediatrician and a parent of a six-year-old with autism. So what are some of the things that you like to do the most um, to really help foster your son's development? Sure, so I think the thing that I had to do to really improve on, you know, trying to help my child at home was really focusing on trying to be present at, you know, at, at all times, um, which I know it sounds kind of cliche, but it's, it's very true. Um, my wife is so good at this and I had to really take a lot of lessons just watching her and how she was able to do that. Um, but, you know, especially with screens everywhere nowadays, especially with COVID, um, Screens can sometimes take up a lot of quality time um, in my house in particular because my son loves his iPad. And if left to his own devices, that's just what he would do. He would be on his device. Um, so when the screen's on, that, you know, that distracts and takes away from his attention. And so I have to then try to try to break into there as there's a break in the action. I then try to put myself into his world and inject myself in there. It doesn't always work, but it really has improved. Um, our relationship and just helping him improve on his skills. And so what I then do is then I try to take anything that he's interested in and then run with it and use it um, and play with him. And I know, you know, part of the question was talking about working, but really the play is the working. And it's a way of trying to get your child to work without them really knowing what they're doing. Um, the, which is, I mean, you're not trying to trick them. It's just, but it's fun because then you get to play with them and then they get to learn at the same time. So whenever he was younger and he would like cars, we would drive, I'd try to drive him around and say, I'm driving the blue car. So, you know, you're, you're showing what you're doing. You're saying what it is and you're giving an adjective saying it's blue. So, you know, you work on those kind of things at the beginning to kind of help him. As he's gotten older, he really likes Blue's Clues, which is awesome. So uh, Blue's Clues was a lot bigger, I feel like, whenever I was, about 20 and and so and my, I had a nephew that loved it and so my family would jokingly call me Steve um, who was who was the host um, at that time but my son likes it and so I will use Blue's Clues as a way of trying to get him to learn things so I'll say hey I need I need help counting so I know this is one but but what's what's this you know and it gets him to try to say it you know you try to act like you don't know it and then they try to interject and so and so I try to look for opportunities and things where I play with him, but then use those opportunities then to teach him. And if you can find yourself, you know, not being present, if you try to pull yourself back in and then go into their world and use what they like, use the play that they enjoy, they will learn from you just by playing with you. Um, so I always try to find times and moments where, where I can do that. Um, I read one time that when a child with autism is humming, um, or stimming, my child, Noah, he hums. Um, they're looking for input. So I try to then find that. Now, sometimes that doesn't always work because I'll ask him and then he'll go, no, I don't. So he's humming, but he's also letting me know he didn't want to do anything. Um, so, okay, that, that, you know, that, was a, that, that effort didn't pay off. But um, I try to find those times when he's doing that where it's like, okay, he needs some input. And then I try to then go in and like I said, go into his world, do the things that he likes to do and then he becomes more interactive. He makes eye contact, um, and it you know it just works out because it's fun, and he's learning. I love it. That's a great, great way for us to help, to to really understand that. Thank you so much. And I heard, you know, so many wonderful things for people to to really understand about a child, you know, so meet them where they are, go into their world, you know, really engage with what they're interested in. And I think those are all such important things for us um, to really focus on, right? That was really, really helpful. Thank you. So Laura, from your perspective as a BCBA, how, what do you think um, when you're working with parents and you're, maybe you're in the home with a parent, what are some additional ways that you could encourage a parent to really, um, work with a, again, I keep using that word work, but play, work, whatever one, or whatever word you want to use um, to support their child's development. Yeah, absolutely. I think so many, everybody on the, the panel has covered some really great topics. And 
uh, has hit a lot of the things that I would even say. Um, but I think to keep things motivating and exciting, like everybody's been talking, meeting your child where they're at and using their interests to keep them engaged is so critical. Uh, for some families, or if you have a child who's maybe harder to motivate or has a limited set of reinforcers um, or objects that they're interested in, trying to expand that, you know, choosing something that might be similar and then playing with them um, in a way that they may play with a, a different, more preferred object, I think can be good. Uh, you might also try to set aside a specific toy or activity or game uh, for therapy time. Like if you have therapists coming into your home, you might need to keep something kind of set aside or something special that you're using to keep therapy a little bit more engaging and exciting. Um, but just finding as many opportunities to uh, capitalize on those natural opportunities that happen throughout the day, you know, uh, they cover so many good things already, but. No, that's great. Thanks, Laura, I appreciate that. So Brittany, when I think about, um, you know, everything from diet to just different types of sensory things, how do you help parents when maybe they're coming to you and, and sensory concerns are on the list of concerns? How do you help them understand what that means and kind of this whole notion of sensory issues, so to speak, in the, in the kind of scale or scope of autism. Yeah, I would really encourage you to be a detective and to observe your child in a way that you could kind of get inside their head and know how they're feeling and thinking. And so all of us process sensory information differently. And so does your child. And so trying to look closely at your child and think about those different senses, taste, smell, hearing, touch, and, and think about the way your child interacts with those kinds of senses. So are they a kiddo who loves things loud and loves funny noises and makes funny noises to hear them and is opening and closing things so that they can hear it? Um, or a kiddo who um, is more aversive to those things or covering your ears a lot, public bathrooms are no-no for you because of flushing toilets, you know, just observe your child the best you can and, and think about the way that they're interacting with the world and then how you can support them in that. And so if you've got a kid who um, just really prefers bland, plain foods and likes things to look a certain way and not change a whole lot, um, you're, there's no point in kind of coming at them with this real dramatic um, plan, uh, you know, as if they were a child who loves spicy things and things that looked crazy and different. And so just knowing your child and knowing what they prefer and what they need, um, I think would go a long way. Thanks. That's really helpful. And I think you're right. I think you really hit on something there. We all, right, have differences. And so, you know, um, some of us love spicy, um, you know, exotic things and others are much more like, yeah, no, thank you. Um, and I think that goes for our kids too. And so I really like how you pointed that out. I think that's really important. And so how do you help people understand when it goes from just kind of all of our normal um, differences and how every one of us likes to experience the world versus what sometimes people want to call a disorder? How do you help people understand you know, is there a sensory disorder or is it all just kind of um, help us understand how that, how we think through that? Yeah, I think sometimes as parents, we get hung up when our child's sensory processing is different than our own and we want to call it a problem. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes they just really prefer a certain kind of shoe or they really, I don't like tags on my clothes either. But if you're someone who just thinks that that's really odd, it's really upsetting when your child does not like tags in their clothes. And so um, just being able to reflect on your own kind of styles and preferences and maybe the burden that you feel like that's placing on you when your child has some really um, particular preferences and kind of starting there. Um, but then there is a place for all of us when our sensory processing becomes so different than other people that it's starting to impact the way that we live our life. And so you're not able to go to these certain places because the sounds or the smells or, you know, the sights are just too much for you and it causes a meltdown or, yeah, you um, get a tiny drop of water on your shirt and you cannot move on with your life until your shirt is changed. And so um, that's where our BCBA friends can be really helpful because sometimes that behavioral response to a sensory input is so extreme and can be modified in a way. But for um, kids that that sensory processing has become a big barrier, that's where you do want some help. And I think sensory processing is so um, kind of misunderstood that that's where that label of disorder has come from. There is no true disorder and the medical community has contributed to this confusion because there are 
professionals out there who will hand you a label like that. But I think the reason that label got made up was because sensory processing differences happen in lots of different presentations and other labels, and it's not easily um, seen or diagnosed. And other labels like autism or ADHD are not easily diagnosed. And sometimes it's a lot easier just to slap a label of, well, something's wrong with your sensory processing and call it a disorder. Uh, but there's not, there's no criteria for having a sensory processing disorder. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a thing, but you can have differences in your sensory processing that are obviously really a big barrier to your life. And an OT or a BCBA can help with that. That's awesome. Thank you. That helps so much. And I think, again, what I get a chance to hear from all of you and, and see in my own clinical practice is that all of us have our own unique ways um, of going about our daily lives. And sometimes um, I do think it's helpful to remind us all of that, right? Like out of all kinds of different ways that I experience my world. Like I don't really like shoes, um, you know? And so, uh, and I wear flip-flops literally probably 330 days a year. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people think that's super weird. I don't. And so, you know, it's one of those things that it's, it's we all have our own stuff, right? And so I certainly, certainly think, Brittany, that was a really helpful, really helpful piece of information. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so then let's think about communication because I know this is also something that really comes up a lot for parents and I think um, parents and clinicians and learners alike. So thinking about language and kind of the difference between speech development and language development. The reason why I wanna go here is because not only to better understand it for everyone who's listening, but then also when we're thinking about what parents can do at home, how do they, have, uh, there's a difference, right? Between speech and language. And so, Michelle, if you'll help us better understand that, I think that'll help parents too as they're at home kind of um, supporting working playing with their family or with their children, um, then they will have, uh, have a little bit more context about what they're up to. Yeah, definitely. So we kind of went over the difference between speech and language, but thinking about speech as those um, sounds that your child is saying, can you understand the words that your child is using? Um, that's more in that speech sound or the stuttering or the voice quality. And then the language piece, I think that more, I think about that more as like the brain. So you can totally have a language that's not speech related. You can have sign language where you're communicating with your hands. You can have your speech generating device that's, you know, giving you talking for you basically. Um, and those are very valid expressive language um, ways to communicate. As far as building up those skills in your child, um, for the speech part of it, just starting down at the very bottom. So if your child is not doing the B, the B sound, um, starting at the very basic by having your child look in a mirror and you're looking in the mirror at the same time. So they're seeing what your mouth is doing and then they're trying to imitate it. So you can put your lips together, say, do what I do, mm, put their lips together, but push it out, but. And whenever they see that, you know, and we've already talked about like motor imitation and doing other imitations, hopefully they can start that way, just really small, um, imitating that sound in isolation. And then you can move that sound up to just the B, the consonant sound with a vowel. So by, bay, boo. Um, trying to get them to do that, moving on up into words, then phrases, sentences, and um, conversation. So that's essentially what we do in therapy with the child is start at that very beginning piece part and then move them on up. As far as language, um, the things that we went over in the presentation, you know, talking to your child, labeling things for your child, providing those communicative temptations. So only pouring a tiny bit of juice to try to get them to communicate with you, hey, need some more juice um, using those words and then you can model as appropriate. I fully 100% agree with Michelle Hainum as far as books. Literacy is your number one is to build that language piece in your child. That's gonna hit on the receptive piece. That's gonna hit on the expressive piece. You can teach your social language skills that way. You can also work on those speech sounds by pointing out you know, as you're reading through your book, if it's about a boy, but boy, did you hear that? You know, and hitting on all of the areas of language with literacy. Um, I think, you know, as your preschooler gets older, using audiobooks 
at the same time as you're reading a book is a great way for a child to enjoy books, hear the words pronounced correctly, and um, it doesn't always have to be in the presence of mom or dad. So on YouTube, there's a lot of those already available. Um, audiobooks through the library, you know, library is your friend as far as child development goes. Love it. That's great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so one other one coming to come in for you. So when I think about um, sign language, I, I would love for you to speak a little bit to that as far as is there a concern that if a parent is helping their child learn sign, um, you know, more or different things like that, that it could slow their language development? That's a great question. And I get asked that a lot, especially for children who might have an apraxia of speech. They're highly unintelligible, but they know what they want to say. And we might talk about a speech generating device for that child. It, the first thing parents typically feel is a fear that if I use this computerized device for my child to communicate, is he or she ever gonna learn how to talk? Or is he just always going to rely on that device? Research has shown that either through sign language, teaching your baby sign language or your preschooler sign or using a speech generating device, that will not slow language development, verbal language development. So your child will still learn to speak if they're going to. Um, some children, they may not. Um, they may need to rely on that device for a long time. Um, and that's okay, you know, we're giving them language, we're decreasing frustration, we're allowing them to have that independence in their communication. But if your child is going to learn how to speak and articulate their sounds, the sign language and the speech generating device will not stop that from happening. It may actually help to facilitate that process. Great, thank you, that's super helpful. So in our last little bit of time together, I wanna talk a little bit more about kind of social emotional, um, you know, that domain. And so when I think about that in particular, uh, this question kind of encompasses everything from behavior to emotional regulation, to helping parents almost build themselves up so they're not quite as frustrated. Oftentimes what I think about when I'm seeing patients is how tough it can be sometimes to be a parent or a caregiver for a little person. And especially when that little person gets frustrated super fast. And so what I wanna do now is kind of go around um, and have everybody have a chance to just, you know, in your own words, it doesn't have to be long, but the ways that you like to think about, if you could give a parent um, a piece of advice uh, about working with a little person who's getting frustrated. Um, this could be a little person with autism. This could be a little person with, you know, language challenges who's getting frustrated. What do you suggest as the best way to kind of help them get back on track, if you will, or um, give them a break, whatever strategies you think are often the most useful. You could also include in this for the parent ways that they can kind of take a take a minute um, and um, reset themselves. So whatever you guys think um, from your perspectives are the most useful, because you all have lots of experience working with kiddos that can get frustrated. So your pieces of advice for, um, for, for mamas and daddies and all sorts of caregivers out there. So Michelle Hamm, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Uh, so this is a really loaded question and there are no right or wrong answers or no right or wrong responses, or um, I always tell parents, um, if you think you're doing it wrong, it's okay. Um, sometimes we um, don't know exactly what we're doing and we're all trying to figure it out together. So don't be so hard on yourselves. And definitely if we've learned anything um, recently through this pandemic is to give ourselves a little bit more grace and a little bit more time. So I think this is a big time to really um, learn um, what it is for us. And so one of the big things I always kind of tell um, parents, um, I had to learn this myself too, was definitely learning what my buttons were and stressors um, because sometimes my reaction to the situation made things worse. So that actually is one of the big things that I think a lot of parents fall into the trap of is having some really big reactions. Um, and I know it's a really hard thing to learn um, how to be cool, calm, and collective when your kid has went from zero to 9,000 in a split second. Um, and so there is that sense of, oh my gosh, I if it's happening when I'm out at a restaurant, I'm really embarrassed. Or even if it's happening at home, but it's happening all the time of 
Um, the first thing I have to do is I have to keep myself calm and ready in the moment because if I'm not, then I'm not going to be able to help my kiddo process through that. So I think one of the key parts is starts with us as parents and educators and therapists and teachers and all that um, is to find a way in ourselves to have the coming undones in our head, um, but on the outwards that we're still able to kind of remain that cool, calm, and collective. Um, I'm not saying all the time that you can't show any emotion, but really trying to help ourselves not raise to the same level of the emotion of the child to start with. So that's where I would start with as a starting ground. I love it. I think that's fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. All right, uh, Brett, if you'll take us next. So whenever I am working with, with Noah and he seems to be getting frustrated about something, and I say working, and that could be anything. That could be trying to get him to eat um, what I want him to eat, or um, trying to get him to learn a new skill, or pick up something when he's not wanting to. Um, sometimes I have to take a step back and think to myself, is what I'm working on, or what I'm trying to get him to do, really worth him getting upset and myself getting upset? Because it's hard. Um, like Michelle said, you know, you you do you sometimes you get upset, and you have to kind of work on that yourself. Um, you know, there there are parent tantrums sometimes, as well as children tantrums. Um, so I guess I would say is, you know, you look at those times when things aren't going well um, and think to yourself, okay, is, is what I'm working on really worth getting upset about? Maybe, maybe the child's had not such a good day. Um, you know, I've come home at the end of the day and I'm not sure exactly what all happened. And so sometimes I'm really working on stuff and my wife has to say, Brett, you know, is that something you really have to push for right now? Um, so, and, and sometimes it's not. Now, um, we, you know, we do have to try to push our kids at times. That's what we do as parents. It's what we should do. But sometimes we have to kind of pick our battles. So what I would say is take the time to really think, okay, is this something that I really need to really push right now? Or can I take a break for a little bit? And can we maybe do something else um, that he enjoys doing um, to maybe calm down? And then after things have kind of calmed down, if it's something we really want to work on, try to go back at it again. But, you know, if, if your child's going from zero to 60 on something, something's going on, it's probably okay to take a break, take a step back, either try something else or really think, do I need to really work on this right now? Love it. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, Laura, how about you next? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that is a wonderful advice. I think uh, from my perspective, one of the things that I would challenge parents to do is to try to reframe how we're thinking about problem behavior. And so I think it's a really important lesson to learn uh, that problem behavior is uh, another way to communicate. And so when you're in those moments and your kid is frustrated and you're frustrated and take a deep breath and step back and think, you know, what are they trying to tell me with this? Um, and so I think that's kind of step number one. I think uh, for the second kind of piece of advice there, I would also challenge everybody to uh, try to focus more on the good things, the positive behavior, the good things that you're seeing instead of kind of being reactive and in that moment so often. I think it's, it's a really slippery slope to kind of go down when you see a child responding certain way or like, but we need to do this thing, <laughs> you know, taking a step back, waiting for something positive to happen or something more appropriate and then giving lots of good attention and reinforcing that behavior. A lot of times problem behavior or these um, challenges that we find ourselves in can be another, uh, it could be a skill deficit. Maybe they don't know what they're supposed to be doing in that moment. And so that's another teaching opportunity. Um, I could keep talking about this all day, but I'll <laughs> stop there. I think that's really spot on. Everybody's got such fantastic spot on um, suggestions and advice. Thank you so much. All right, Brittany, over to you. I would go back to Brett's earlier wisdom about being present in the moment. That sounds so simple, but that may, that can arm you with a lot of things. My BCB friends have taught me about antecedents. And, you know, if you can anticipate that when you're making a meal or you're trying to get some laundry done, or you're trying to do some adult thing, that is when you're going to see some problem behavior. Like you should just anticipate that and know that. And the more that you can be, you know, present in the moment and anticipate that it's probably going to happen. The second I turn the oven on, like they're going to need my attention and to try to kind of prepare yourself for that and whatever that looks like, you know, knowing that 
this behavior is going to happen and I can respond instead of react because it's kind of expected. And I think sometimes as parents, we pretend to be surprised, like, why are you throwing a fit about this again? It's like, we should just know it's going to happen. And the more that you're present and not trying to multitask, I swear multitasking is like the devil of parenting, you can kind of see that storm brewing and intervene a little earlier if you're really present with your child and not trying to do a hundred things at once. Sometimes you have to, but the best that you can trying to limit some of that multitasking is really helpful. And then the other piece I would just say is, um, you know, there's something called co-regulation. And I think as parents, we would love to think that we can, as soon as our kid is at level 10, um, you know, appeal to their logic and try to reason with them about why this makes no sense that you're throwing a fit. And we love to do that, like right as they're screaming in our face, that does not make any sense. You cannot reason with your child. There's research that shows it that they cannot understand your logic or rationale when they're screaming, like they've got to get. So if you can remain calm and they can get lower to that level, then maybe you could appeal a little bit to their logic and reason based on your kid. Um, but don't, it's so tempting to do it in the moment when they're screaming at you and just, just don't just breathe, wait it out. I would agree. I would agree. Boy, do I wish I had known that with my first child. He's, he had to suffer through many, many, many uh, attempts at, at this mama trying to be like, now let's talk about this. <laughs> Been there for sure. All right, Michelle, how about you? So I think everyone has given such really good ideas. I did write down a few ideas that I had. Number one, um, and I think this has been said, but this is just saying it in a different way. Behaviors are messages. So just trying to figure out what it is with that antecedent. What are they trying to communicate to you, taking into account their language level? Um, and then thinking about that whole thing that an escalated adult cannot de-escalate an escalated child. So just doing your best to keep yourself calm Visual supports are super helpful, especially at that point in time when your child has just had all they can take. Um, you may just show them a picture of their room. They can go to their room, have a chill time, and then we can you know, proceed with our day. Pre-teaching those situations, like Brittany was saying, if you know when you're cooking, that's gonna be a bad time, then go ahead and pre-teach to your child, hey, I'm gonna make dinner. You know, This is something that you can do. And again, going back to, you know, phrasing it in the positives, these are things you can do, not you can't be, put, you know, bugging me, you can't be tugging on my clothes. So telling them what they can do during those times. Um, I will say video self modeling has been super effective for me in my own parenting. So when my three and four year old would have tantrums, I would pull my phone out, I would videotape that, and then I would show that to them later. Um, and we would talk about it, you know, what it looked like. A lot of times they were shocked at what they looked like. And then later on, if it would happen again and I would start to videotape, they would stop because they didn't want to have to watch that with me. So um, that video self-modeling I found in lots of different ways to be super important. And then my last thing is just, just the same thing other people have said, pause, stop, don't over talk. Yeah, I think that's great. Well, you guys, this has been a fantastic time together. I appreciate you all so very much. And I think I'll sum it up with this. I am always delighted to get a chance to hear about all the things that both parents and caregivers can do to support their um, their loved little loved one at home. And then I also think it's so fun to get a chance to hear and think about all the things that little kids can do, right? All the things they're learning how to do, but then also all the things they can do. So often we spend so much time talking about all the things that, you know, they have to learn how to do and the things that maybe they're delayed in, or all these different things that, you know, sometimes we're looking at those deficits, but yet there's so many things they can can do. And so I would encourage everybody just to keep continuing to look for all the great things that they can do, they are doing, and then certainly reminding yourself as the person in their life that's supporting that, that development to really just keep focusing on what can they do, right? Whether that be while you cook dinner, while they're running through the house, you know, okay, they can't run, but they can uh, use safe feet, like you heard, you know, they can help you wash the vegetables, things like that. So certainly great time together. I hope it was meaningful for everyone. And we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody.